love you, Jesus. Come on, your eyes are closed. All the focus is on Him. Come on, my mind has been a lot of places this week. Uh, it's visited fear and doubt, anger. Some of us, come on, down the road of lust. Uh, but I'm thankful I can close my eyes, lift my voice. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. As we open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 50, we will read one passage, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7. What a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. God is still on the throne. Praise the Lord. We want to remember the uh, brother... Irving Baxter's family, he's passed, he actually passed on election day, we had him scheduled for a prophecy conference at the end of uh, this month, and so you'll see that on your uh, bulletin, but that is of course being uh, canceled due to his passing, very unexpected, we want to remember him in prayer, and his family I should say, and know that the Lord will bring comfort to them, great, great prophecy teacher, highly respected around the world, as a great, great student of the word of the Lord. Amen. Isaiah chapter 15, verse 7. One thing we know, Jesus is coming back. And it's going to happen very soon. Very, very soon. Very soon. Amen. Isaiah chapter 50 and 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. I shall not be ashamed. Lord, I thank you for your word, the name that is above every name. Thank you, Father, that we can turn to that word that changes not. So much has changed even in the last week, and there's so much uncertainty. But as we stand in this place on the unchanging word of God, we are certain of this. You are for us. Your love is here, your grace, and you are going to lead and guide us. I pray now, Lord, that you would just do that. Use my lips to speak, Father, to the hearts of clay and let lives be changed by the power of your word. And as one we say in Jesus' name, thank you for honoring the word of the Lord by standing. You can be seated. Why don't we give the Lord another great praise for his word. Amen. As we speak of shame, we cannot begin this conversation without visiting the very first man and woman that were ever created. They were placed in the Garden of Eden with liberty to eat of all the fruit, all the trees in the garden, except for the one. Free will was granted to them, but in order to exercise the free will, there had to be an option to choose against God. Of course, God creates Adam, and then he creates Eve. After creating Eve, uh, Genesis 2 and 23 records, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Verse 25 says, and they were both naked and the man and his wife and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. The first thing we find out about this man and his wife, Adam and Eve, is that they were naked. That's their outward. Outward does matter. So much so that God went ahead and let us know how the outward appeared. The second thing is that it lets us know the first feeling they felt. And the first thing they felt that we know of is they felt no shame. No shame. Why does God mention the fact that they did not feel shame. I mean, there are plenty of options that he could have utilized here instead of shame. He could have said, and they felt no anxiety. Or he, they felt no suffering. They felt no pain. But instead, he said, they, he told us what they did not feel. He says, they did not feel shame, I should say. He could have also said what they did feel. Well, they, they, they were naked and they felt happy. Or they, they were full of joy or full of peace or thankfulness. But he said, no, they were naked and they didn't have any shame. They didn't have any shame. I believe, no doubt, the reason God is letting us know why they felt no shame is because he knew that shame would be the enemy's greatest weapon perpetrated against humanity. And so he let him know and let us know from the very beginning we were not created to live in shame. You know the story how it continues along as Adam and Eve 
They take of the fruit and sin is entered. And with sin instantly comes shame for they realize they were naked. And for the first time they experience this shame. What must it have felt like to feel shame in this moment? If you can, you should imagine every moment you felt like you could just crawl under a rock, your face turned red, you were hot, all of that combined into one moment, uh, just desiring to disappear. And so they feel shame because of sin. And, and so Genesis 3 and 7 gives us their response. And the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They instantly made fig leaves and covered parts of themselves. Now notice, God is not present at the time. They're not hiding themselves from God at this time. They are now hiding themselves from each other. Where they once had been naked and vulnerable completely between each other, now there were parts in their marriage that were hidden, concealed. Now separation and isolation Division is entered into their marriage. Uh, it all results from shame. Shame has now affected their relationship with the ones they hold dearest and nearest to them. Let me tell you, shame will do more than block your relationship between God. It will hinder and hamper the relationship you have to those nearest to you and dearest to you. But not only did they hide from each other, we know the rest of the story. In 8, they continue, verse 8 of chapter 3, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. What follows then after they're hiding, so now they're hiding parts of themselves from each other. And now they're hiding themselves from God, the very God that loves them so very much. Of course, the next verse is the first recorded dialogue between God and man that we have. This will be the first conversation that we have written in the Bible where God speaks to man and man speaks to God. In verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. As I read it this week again, I found it quite interesting that the first words that God heard from his creation were fear naked blaming hiding the first words weren't I love you you're so amazing you're great but the first words man ever spoke to God were about his fear were about the fact that he was hiding and then he began to blame other people Adam and Eve notice this they both admit to fear I'm afraid they said they both admit to hiding so we hid but they don't admit to sin they, they refuse to take responsibility for the disobedience. They'll take responsibility of the result, but not the source. They won't take ownership of it. They'll own the consequence, but not the problem. That's shame. They, they, you know, the truth of the matter is they could have just spoken truth. Where are you guys? What's going on? Well, we were hiding because you told us not to eat of the fruit and we disobeyed everything you said to do and it was a horrible mistake and we're really sorry and we did this anyway. They could have just said that. But even me saying that sounds funny because that's not what shame is. That's not what we do. No, when we sin and guilt pricks our heart, we hide. And where do we hide? We hide in shame. We hide in shame, not confessing their sins. They, 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 they do not respond to the guilty verdict here. They tried to hide. It's shame, and then shame brings blame. Now, there's a difference in feeling guilty, and there's a difference in guilt and shame. Guilt says, you did wrong. Shame says, you are wrong. I said the difference between guilt and shame is that guilt says you did something bad, but shame convinces you that you are bad. Guilt is about what you do. Shame is about who you are. So God says in verse 11, he says, who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commit? Notice he doesn't talk about their fears. He doesn't talk about that they're hiding. He says, what did you do? Have thou eaten of the fruit that I commanded you not to eat? Did you disobey me? He's trying to get them to own up. Just tell me the truth. 
Tell me what you did. Tell me the truth. But shame has them hiding from what God has created them to be. God, shame has them hidden in, 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 in fig leaves in the woods, uh, hiding, thinking that they can escape the guilt if they'll just hide in shame. See, sin is bad. That's why there's guilt. Guilt is not bad. Guilt is the alarm that lets you know you're sinning. Thank God. Matter of fact, if you don't feel guilty for sin anymore, you're in a very bad place. I said, if, and, and if you, come on, I said, if you don't feel guilty and you're sinning, friend, you're in a very dangerous place. Thank God. Thank God for the alarm of guilt. The alarm of guilt that goes off and rings and rings and rings. ringing now you know what I do I can't just turn my alarm off but instead I've got my alarm it's buzzing it's ringing it's blaring and instead of turning it off you know what I do I go I'm gonna I'm gonna hide it come on I'm gonna hide it and still there I need some more stuff I need some more you know what hey you stupid idiot give me that and we're mean now and we're covering up come on the cover cover, cover it up give me some this is going to help this relationship will help this drink will help this pro this will help i've just got to cover up i've got to cover it up i need to, come on i'll cover it up no I, it's still there i can still feel it buzzing in my pocket i can still hear it ringing uh, give me something else uh, give me some more stuff uh, give me some more and next thing you know come on this is how people walk around uh, under the load of shame uh, shackled uh, shackled and bound uh, but come on trying to cover up a sound now you scream loud and you're angry and you're ugly at your friends and you're ugly to your wife and and and, and all it is is a cover-up uh, it's a cover-up uh, the relationship you've always got to be in when all you would have to do uh, all you really have to do uh, is get down to the guilt and say you know what i did it turn it off uh, and i can live without shame if i can just learn to address the guilt alarm that's going on and so God says just confess it just confess it just confess it because I cannot forgive what you do not repent and you will never repent what you do not confess so keep it shame that's why shame is deadly because shame keeps the response of confession closed and let me tell you a lot of we've been talking about repentance a lot and you must you've got to forgive but let me just say this a lot of things cannot be healed until they're confessed because it's easy it's easier to forgive oh i gotta forgive you if you slap me across the face uh, brother uh, brother edwards i've got to forgive you and i do forgive you for slapping me across the face however if our relationship is ever going to be mended you're going to have to come to me and say you were sorry yeah oh yeah you're so whoa is that so? no i have to forgive him in order to go to heaven and get it out of my spirit but let me tell you until there's confession from the one that did wrong the relationship will never be restored and i know you're sitting there high and mighty saying well i forgave him but there's some of you need to come off the high and mighty tower get down to somebody and say i did you wrong i was wrong and come on baby i said your marriage needs you to come off the high horse get down to your wife and say i was wrong i made a mistake i failed and i need you to forgive me and until we get to that place uh, come on until you get to that place with God he can't forgive what you won't confess confess with your mouth unto salvation you've got to confess it you've got to get the light uh, on it uh, but the enemy now has Adam and Eve hidden not only are they so full of shame that, that, that they're hiding they're, they're no longer fulfilling their purpose the purpose of their life which is to reflect the glory of God in their generation their mission that's the mission the enemy knows if I can get you under shame hiding under shame you will not fulfill and accomplish what God has called you to do and to be and so I feel guilty 
I did this bad thing and now I'm under shame because of what I did. But, but while we're looking at what we do, because guilt is about what we do, let's look at what the Bible says about our do. Here it is, Romans 3 and 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I know the devil's got you convinced that you're the only one, but the devil is a liar everybody has sinned and everybody's got guilt I know we all look really cute and pretty and, and dressed up real fancy and nice coming in our cars getting out in our little church no 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 we might look good but friend every one of us have sinned we're all sinners so the Bible says that is what I've got to say about that you're a sinner that's what you do you, you, you are a sinner and here is who you are. He said, but let's talk about who you are. He says, Psalms 139 and 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God's word says this about you. Uh, you are not, come on somebody, I feel the Holy Ghost. You are not the lie that shame has tried to convince you that you are. Well, I was lied to, so I'm a liar. Well, I was sexually abused, so I am wrong and I am bad. It's because I am evil. It's because I am horrible. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are loved by God. Who you are. Come on, somebody. I know the value, the thing that you did is bad, but your value is not based on what you did. It's based on who your father is, and you are loved by God. And I would to God there are some Pentecostals that, to just realize that we aren't saved by works that there's nothing you did that bought you the love of God and there's nothing you could do that would take you away come on if you start believing that somehow what you do gets you into heaven friend you're going to believe that what you do can make him stop loving you but that's a lie you can never not be loved by God Come on, I know I got some holier than thou. They can't even clap on that because they thought Jesus loved them because they were baking peanut brittle. But then there's some of us. Come on, we don't even know how to make peanut brittle. We've messed up. We're a total wreck. But we can say, God, here is who I am. I'm vulnerable. This is what I've done. And he still loves me. And so it is that my value of who I am is based on who my father is. Shame. Shame, And so it is that I can experience shame because of things that I do, sin that I commit. Shame can be the result of sin that was perpetrated upon me, something done to me. Shame also comes from things that are witnessed or seen, experienced in our lives. And it's here we find the very famous story of the lady with the issue of blood. I won't be long today. She is bleeding. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She has no name. Even though she's recorded Matthew by Mark and Luke, we don't know her name. Quite odd that three guys would forget the girl's name. But perhaps the name's not there because it could be anyone's name. Because there's more, just, there's more than one way to bleed. Bartimaeus has a name because blindness is specific to the eyes. But bleeding is specific to us all. He could have written, there was a man, Matthew Tuttle, who was bleeding by, because of rejection. He could have written, there was a woman with your name bleeding because she was forgotten. He could have written another's name and said, they were, they were bleeding from the pain of not feeling valued. But we all bleed in some way. But as she's bleeding, and she'd been bleeding for 12 years, she was unclean according to the laws. She couldn't leave her house. Everything the lady would touch would become unclean. She'd been on her menstrual cycle for 12 years bleeding. Now, there's no, there's no running waters. There's no showers. There's no, there's no modern amenities that female products to help her know no, it's, it's a 12-year it's a, it's a disaster. It chased her everywhere she went. She couldn't leave. Everything she touched and anyone she touched was called unclean for 12 years. Can you imagine? I, looking eyeball to eyeball with this woman hadn't happened in 12 years. 
for her head had always hung down. If she had to get out of the house, it was covered in masks and nobody could know who she was. She lived under constant shame. It's this condition we find her in in Mark chapter 5 when she says, if I can just touch Jesus. If, if I... Get, now, and the Bible also says she has tried everything else. It's astounding how we'll try everything before we try Jesus. <laughs> Fig leaves drugs, alcohol, doctors we're over there doing the nature's path thing, eating and drinking kombucha and spark and all this stuff but I mean the, I'm going to tell you those nature's path people rip you off like, my goodness I didn't know a leaf could cost this much money she'd given all her money to the Advocare people to the Noni Juice people all of them They'd all, he, they got it all she was out of money. That's how it is, isn't it? Well, I'll just try this. Well, I'll just try that. I'll just try, I'll just try. Instead of doing the thing you know would work. I know what worked. You know what works. That's why you're here. I said, that's why you're here, because you know. Deep down inside, you know what you need to do. But she said, I'm going to touch him. Now, the law of her day was that she could touch no man except immediate family. A man could only be touched by his wife or his daughters or his mother. There was, there was no tolerating. But she says, I'm, I'm going to break law by getting out. I'm going to break the law by touching him. And if I touch him, I shall be whole because I am tired of the bleeding. And at some point in everyone's life, they come to the, I'm tired of the bleeding. And they either get on top of a bridge and jump off. They get needles and put them in their arms. Or they say, get me to Jesus. And I just believe I'm with some people this Sunday morning uh, that have tuck, cause said I'm not going to stand on the edge of a bridge. Uh, I'm tired of the needles. I'm tired of the drink. I'm tired of relationships. You know what? Get me to the Pentecostal church down there. I know they're crazy. I know they're going to talk about me. I know they run and spin and dance and do all that crazy stuff, but I'm tired of bleeding. I'm tired. I'm tired of bleeding. I'm tired. I don't care. Get me to Jesus. Uh, get me to Jesus if I can just touch him. Uh, I will be made whole and she begins to push through the press because when you make up your mind to get to Jesus there's going to be pressure and the pressure is people I said the final step before she got to Jesus was pushing people out of her life come on I said you got you to gotta get over what everybody's going to think about you even in this house she had to push away the Jesus people I said when she got to the Jesus people, it still wasn't easy. She still had to make way and say, I don't care. See, some of y'all look up here and know and think, oh, he's crazy. And Steve, he's crazy. No, they're just at a place where they don't care anymore. They said, I'm going to get to Jesus. I'm going to get. And if you could ever get that in your mind, if you could ever learn the power that says, I've got to get to Jesus. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody does. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what they talk about me around the dinner table this afternoon. I don't care if it's on live stream. I can't bleed anymore. I can't bleed anymore. So she pushes through the people. Obviously, she's covered. No one knows who she is. No one recognizes her, but in verse 29... The Bible says, I mean, verse 28, she touches him. And when she touches him, she touched him. And verse 28, and straightway, the fountain of her blood, and straightway means it was immediate. And in one moment of touching Jesus, uh, she was healed of the plague. Let me just tell you something. You can push through the press and you can touch him. And when you touch him, he does heal. I said he does heal. He can heal the body. He can heal it instantly in a moment. The thing you've tried to find solutions for for 12 years, one moment, it's gone. One moment. That's the power of touching Jesus. Touching Jesus. Come on. It's all that matters. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. And instantly she touches him. And in verse 30, Jesus immediately knowing something's virtue has gone out of him he turns about and he says who touched me 
Who touched me? Who touched my clothing, he said. Now hold on, hold on, hold on. He's wanting to know. He's wanting to have a conversation. Why we got to talk about it? Miracle's already done. He's looking right at her. The Bible says he looks at her. Right now, she's in a mess. She's got a problem because she's healed. Now, if it's me, I'm like, lady, you're healed. You got what you came for. Get out of town, baby. Go home. Have a party. Get married. Live your life. You don't got to talk to him. You're healed. You, you, you got the touch. You don't have to have the talk. But he wants to talk. He said, somebody's touched me. And I want to talk to them. No, lady, don't. That's embarrassing. You go up there and talk to him. What on earth? Why on earth? And why, Jesus, do you need to talk to this lady? She's already been embarrassed enough. Lord, her whole life has been lived in shame, at least the last 12 years have been. But, but she came anyway. And look at how she comes in verse 33. The woman fearing and trembling. Oh, oh. Now, now I'm reading it this week and I'm like, hold on, fearing and trembling? Four verses ago, you just were healed of a 12-year sickness. Doesn't seem like the emotion of healing would be fear and trembling. Seems like to me if you'd been suffering for 12 years and in a moment it was all gone, you would be jumping and shouting. It would be joy unspeakable. You'd be rolling on the floor. But what on earth, chick? You're, you're afraid and you're trembling? Well, of course she passed away. Well, yeah, she's probably at a bar or something, you know. She's probably out there at the club. She's probably hanging out with people she wouldn't, but she's surrounded by a bunch of, no, 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 no. She's not at a club. She's not out at the bar. She's not surrounded by a bunch of horrible people. You know where she is? She came and fell down before she's in church. I said, she's sitting in church, healed. No blood issue. But the word of God is pulling her and saying, I need to have a talk with you. But she can't come forward without fear and trembling. She's afraid. Hey, friend, she's afraid not of the blood issue, for there is no blood issue. It's gone. She's gripped by fear and trembling because she's bound by shame. And I've come to tell you that your body can be healed. But you can still sit in church and be afraid. I said you can still. Oh, come on, somebody. Uh, and, and I know we want to scoff and laugh at her. And come on, somebody. But she's af she is afraid in front of the man that loves her most. This is astounding. She is trembling in church with the Holy Ghost moving across with the eyeballs of God in the flesh looking at her and his voice saying, come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy. But before you laugh, before you mock, before you make fun, let me ask you, what are you afraid of? I know you healed and got the Holy Ghost spoken tongues, baptized in Jesus' name. Well, what's the talk that has to be had that you can't have? Because shit, just get, just preacher, just just preach me, just preach me healthy. No, 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 no. No, I didn't. I didn't come to preach you healthy. I came to preach you whole. I said I didn't come to preach healing. Oh, ha have a healing service and everybody comes. And boy, we preach about instant healing, instant healing, instant healing. But we forget that there's a whole lot of people that get healed, but they never address the fact that they're living in shame. And there's some in this house uh, feeling in the Holy Ghost. Uh, you cannot be whole until you've overcome the shame. And you've got to say, come. And she came in verse 33, shaking. I, I, I guarantee you she ain't looking at him she's not looking at him she's looking down at the ground why would you look at the ground he loves you he's going to give his life for you because I'm ashamed and shame has got me believing stuff about me that's not true shame has been telling me for the last 12 years you're a failure you're not loved he doesn't care about you nobody's going to love you if you talk to him they'll make fun of you if you go to the altar and confess they'll leave you the church will mock you if you tell your wife if you tell your husband they're going to abandon you that's how shame has got her and so she comes to him trembling and afraid and she fell 
down. And here's what she did. She told him all the truth. all the truth everything I've done and everything that's been done to me because you can't be set free from shame until you're willing to to take out the alarm clock and say the guilt here's the reason for the guilt here's the reason for the shame God here's what I did here's what was done to me God here's what happened and I saw it this is how I feel ladies and gentlemen when you will tell him the truth is when you're set free from shame. This is what I saw. Now, look, no, it doesn't say she repented. It just said she told the truth. That means she's not repenting for some sin. It means it wasn't some sin she had done. That's got to see. Shame can get in you without sin that you've ever done. But something had happened. She had seen something or someone had said something or something had happened and got a hold of her. And so she said, Lord, I, don't have, I can't say I'm here to repent. I'm just here to reveal. Because you can't be free from shame until you're willing to reveal the problem. We talk a lot about the source and we talk a lot about the reason but we never get to the cause what's the root of it all she told him all she told him all shame is a dark cavern and the only way to get it out is to bring light that's why Paul says all things that are reproved are made manifest by light the entrance of the word the psalmist says the entrance of thy words giveth light Lord I need not the harsh light that brings it to uh, in front of everybody no but the light that comes to bring healing and God says I can't do an operation in a cave I can't no come on somebody I can't I can't cut it out and take it away if you won't let me shine light on it I gotta I got you to get you to take off the suit coat to, uh, the other suit coat the other relationship take it off come on come on come on. get off that get get out of the lie get out of the whatever you're using to hide behind the the overachiever the I've got to do everything perfect and I'm super hard worker and I'm never gonna let anybody down and that you're just trying to hide you're just trying to hide you're just trying to hide you need more money can why because you're ashamed you've got to have come on somebody in the root of it is to hide this problem in me this thing I'm ashamed of that I will not confess but I feel the Holy Ghost calling somebody this morning to let the word and the light of the word shine upon you what on earth lady what are you thinking you're going to go talk to him you're going to go to the altar and you're going to confess you're gonna go. You're gonna go to a counselor and tell them. Every they're gonna laugh at you. They're gonna mock you. He's gonna make Jesus is gonna listen to everything you've done and everything they did to you, and he is going to kick you. He's gonna tell you, you know what? You shouldn't. You're not worthy of health. I'm gonna curse you again with that issue of blood. What are you thinking? Your family's gonna be so embarrassed when they realize you snuck out of the house and you went up to Jesus. What, what, what? No, that's, that's all the words of shame. That's shame. Who do you think you are gonna to touch him? You're worthless, nobody. You're nothing. But verse 34, after she had revealed everything to him, I'm sure they hadn't made eye contact the whole time, Bishop. But after she let all the truth out, everything that had happened and everything she had done and everything been done to her verse 34 here's what he says and he said to her read it with me and he said to her stop right there he said to her what daughter because <laughs> only family only family can touch each other <laughs> <laughs> and she, with one word with one word he changed her identity see ladies and gentlemen uh, you can touch Jesus uh, and it can change your health uh, it can heal your body but one word 
if you'll just have the talk. I said, if you'll just have the talk, if you'll just make your way to a prayer room, get your knees bent, and you start saying, God, okay, here it is. I'm ashamed to even tell you it's so bad. I'm so ashamed. But here it is. Here's all the truth. Here's all the truth. I'll tell you what will happen. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to banish you to hell. He's not going to do all the things shame has you convinced he will do. He's going to look at you and do more than change your your, your body. He's going to do more than heal the blood. He's going to change your identity. And you can walk out of that prayer meeting saying, I am a child of God. I am loved by God. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm a daughter. And now I'm free. I'm free. There was no condemnation. There was no damnation. That's all a lie. Everything, come on, as you visit it in your mind, and deep down inside, there's something in you that wants to tell it. You want to talk about it. You want with everything inside of you to confess it. But you can't. Because of my family. I can't because of my job. I can't because of whatever shame has lied to you. And I've come to tell you he's a liar. It's all lies. It's all lies of shame. Whatever you confess, no matter how great, no matter how bad, no matter how dark, let me tell you, God isn't going to condemn you. I'm going to tell you even further, the church isn't going to condemn you. There is no sin that we can't love you through. There is no darkness that we can't get the light to you. There's not, it's a lie. There's nothing you can tell God. There's nothing you can tell these people that come on, there would be, oh, it's a lie. Come on, somebody. Come on, think of how you would respond if your brother came to you uh, and confessed. uh, Brother Keith, if I came to you and I said, I'm struggling with pornography and I'm struggling with my thoughts of leaving my family, you would look at me and say, what? Have we practiced? No. What would you say? I love you. What? I love you. Is that what you would tell me? Is that what you would tell me? Is that what you would tell me? Is that what you would tell me, Jerry? Was that what you would tell me? So if you believe that you would tell me that, why can't you believe that we will tell you that? believe that the mercy you'll have for me will be extended to you you'll be forgiven and you can walk out of this house without the load of shame no longer shackled by guilt and you can be free you can be free for he that the son has set free is free indeed is free in word is free from shame Hallelujah. I'm done Daughter, you can touch me anytime you want, baby. It was all a lie that we weren't family. It was all a lie that you had to be embarrassed. We can hug because we're family. Shame keeps you distance from God. The biggest issue you've got, baby, isn't the blood. Because then he says... Thy faith, let's put up there verse 34. Said it all, thy faith has made thee whole. In verse 29, she was healed. In verse 34, she's made whole. He said, and now you can go in peace. Because let me just tell you something. You can be healed and not be in peace. You can be surrounded by the Jesus people like she was, celebrating a physical miracle, but no peace. You can have, come on somebody, you can be baptized in Jesus' name. Be sitting in church, singing in the praise team. But there's no peace. Oh yeah, now I'm talking. You can be teaching your Sunday school class, being a hostess and an usher, drive the golf cart and preach the message, but not have peace. Why? Because you've never told him all the truth.
feel the Holy Ghost. I'm tired of listening to the lies. Somebody's got to get there this morning. Friend, you can be healed today. But more important, you can be made whole. But you're going to have to have a talk, just you and Jesus, you and the Master. You have to find a place of confession. Your marriage can be restored. It's going to take some confessions. Your relationship with God can be whole. And I'm preaching to people you've been in church for all your life, and you keep covering it up. Maybe it's not drugs or an alcohol in the relationships. Maybe it's just more jobs and ministries. Come on, somebody. If I could just get the solo, if I could just do more, if I could just do, and like the works are going to cover the alarm that just won't go off. But I wonder this morning if there's just somebody that could open up and say, Lord, I see your eyes as they're drilling holes through me. I'm ready for all the truth. Here's what happened. Here's what I did or here's what was done. And God, I need you. And I hear the voice of heaven from a father that gave his life with tears that streamed down his face this morning looking at you saying, daughter, son, you can have peace. It's going to feel so good when you take off the layers of shame. It's going to feel so free when you no longer are worried about what everybody's trying to think and say about you. It's going to be free once again to be as God created you to be, not to live in shame. As we stand across this house, I have more to say, and maybe we'll round it up tonight. I don't know, but I feel something drawing this morning. I know that this is a message, and each it's touching us different places and people at where you're at. If you want to come to the front, you can, but if you don't come to the front, I wonder if you could just kneel at your pew where you are. And perhaps there's a conversation you and him need to say, you maybe you just need to get down and say, God, I'm committing to all the truth. I'm committing that my prayer life is going to be no longer one that's prayed in darkness, but I'm going to pray and when it happens and when sin happens, friend, the moment you feel the guilt, the way you should respond is instant confession. Come on, the moment that you feel guilt, don't you lie to yourself and try to hide it. The moment you mess up and you fail, the moment, come on, you act upon the thought, it needs to be confessed for if we confess, hallelujah, our sin or our faults James says uh, one to another he says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much uh, there's a conversation of confession that has to take place before my prayers can even get through to heaven uh, come on that's why there's been no peace and it feels like you're praying up against a brick wall it's because there's unconfessed sin in your life uh, but if you will confess with your mouth uh, hallelujah if you will open up the light uh, and say Lord let the light of your word shine into where I'm at I can't live here no more I'm tired of bleeding I know there'll be some that walk out with just another robe covering the wound but there's somebody this morning that'll leave that says I'm not going to live in shame anymore I have made up my mind I will not live in shame as we pray across this house and we begin to sing a song and we have moments come on we're committing to a new lifestyle and a way of living a new way of life I'm no longer bound by these shackles Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I pray over every heart in this house, every individual, Father, that now begins the journey. Perhaps the enemy speaks to them now, sowing seed of confusion. Don't do it. Where do you start? Just start. Where does it matter? Just start. Just start today and say, Lord, I'll no longer live in the lie.